Um, re repeated ETVs is, you know, again, this is just a, a cool little nuance. Again, the residents made another video here. Um, there's absolutely no reason not to consider a repeat ETV. If it worked really well the first time, maybe the child was young or they had some questionable anatomy in terms of thickness of the floor or the membranes, doing a second ETV, again, at the, um, the possible advantage or um, upside of not having a shunt in that patient for the rest of their life and the rest of your career um, is really advantageous. So here, if I just pause it for a second, I'm sorry. You can see the ETV hole has been scarred over. Um, and as you, um, you know, go back down right through that same track there, you can refenestrate, reopen up that floor. And certainly we have many, many cases where re-ETV was successful after the initial uh, one failed. And again, a lot of that has to do with the age of the patient, patient selection, um, but the presence of an ETV failure should not be an automatic indication to go ahead and do a shunt. Some of it will depend on experience and comfort level, but certainly plenty of success stories to demonstrate that this is a successful uh, endeavor in a, in a select population of patients. So some nuances there, so the diminished prepontian interval, the repeat ETV, these are not necessarily the things that you'll start out with, but certainly things that you'll notice are um, part of the armamentarium as you, um, as you build your skill set and as you, you know, progress through your training and residency, you'll see these um, and have a, a sense of you know, how far to push the endoscopic envelope um, based upon the experience of the operator and uh, the etiologies of the hydrocephalus. So always consider an ETV as an alternative at shunt malfunction, particularly at shunt infection because the shunt's coming out anyway. So taking out the shunt, considering an ETV, and then if it fails, you'll have to put the shunt back in anyway. You haven't really lost anything. Probably it's not gonna be a great idea if they've had meningitis or a bad hemorrhage. Doesn't, it's not a complete contraindication, but a relative. Um, you know, all the imaging things that we know about that we've talked about all four weeks, looking at the aqueductal stenosis, understanding the anatomy. Um, as I mentioned before, consider aborting the ETV. If you get in there and you don't feel comfortable and it doesn't look like the anatomy is right, you're scared about the vasculature um, uh, being um, a roadblock, way safer to place the shunt than to create a vascular injury or create a pseudoaneurysm. Um, so all these things are, are nuances that, you know, well beyond decision making at the point of a medical student, but you know, when you're standing there in the room and you're hearing these discussions, these are things that we're thinking about and deciding in real time. Whether or not you need external ventricular drainage as part of, you know, the decision to go from a shunt to an ETV is something, again, on a case-by-case -case basis. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.